Well, good, good evening. Uh, my name is Mitch Weisberg. I'm here for EdChat Interactive. And let me just uh, share my screen here so you can see uh, what we're here for. We're here for teaching in and with virtual museums. There's going to be a lot of STEM lessons that we'll be, uh, we'll be covering. The main speaker is going to be Tom Barry, who's from the Cradle of Aviation Museum. That's in Long Island. And if you have not been to the museum, it is really cool. You can see uh, the lunar module. You can see the Spirit of St. Louis. Um, there's a huge history of aviation and uh, space travel uh, based out of Long Island. Uh, and they have a ton of lessons for kids and both kids who visit the museum and as we'll be seeing in a few minutes uh, kids uh, teachers or classes that visit the museum virtually. This is uh, EdChat Interactive. This is our, our, our last event for a while. We're having one event in July with uh, Monica. Oh, I'm sorry. We're having an event tomorrow night. How could I forget that? Uh, with Ika Johnson, who's going to be talking about STEM challenges that motivate students. She's a teacher out of Houston, um, really a remarkable individual. And then on July 14th, we're going to have Monica Joshi. Uh, Monica is actually from India, and uh, she's been teaching teachers in, I think, around a dozen schools in India. Um, how to use engaging content, a lot of it involving augmented reality. So uh, she has some phenomenal examples of things that really engage students. Uh, Monica is going to be here July 14th, and then um, we're going to be setting up a schedule of events in, in August as well. So let me, uh, again, um, for tonight, we're having teaching in and with virtual museums, and let me stop sharing my screen. And uh, here's Tom um, coming to you from New York, which yeah. is where I am also. Yeah. So it's, it's kind of dusk here. It was a beautiful day. Oh, it was gorgeous. Absolutely. And it's a beautiful, beautiful early evening out there. You can see outside my window here. Uh, mm -hmm. I live in, in Jamaica, Queens, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, just, just across the border a little ways from Nassau County, uh, where I work at the Cradle of Aviation Museum. Uh, I'll give you a little background on myself uh, before we uh, before we jump into uh, the content. Uh, oh boy, why did that start at that slide? That should not have started there. I was going through it, so I'm going to stop that share and go back. Uh -huh. That's a great start, Tom. Good job. You're doing awesome. Um, so, a little background on myself. Um, I am the assistant director of education at the Cradle of Aviation Museum. And my job there is to, is to oversee uh, the education department uh, along with my education director and ensure that everything gets booked properly and everything goes off well. Uh, prior to coming to Cradle of Aviation, I was at the Intrepid Sea, Air and Space Museum um, in Manhattan, where I was the senior manager of community engagement and family programs. Uh, and when I was there, uh, my job essentially was to uh, provide an authentic museum experience uh, for folks who would not otherwise have one. Uh, for whatever that reason may be, it could have been socioeconomic, it could have been geographic, uh, it could be any, any very sundry reason. Uh, so I feel like my work at the Intrepid uh, kind of put me in a position to respond uh, to our current situation where nobody can get to a museum due to health reasons and actually uh, at Intrepid uh, health reasons was one of the uh, reasons we, we tried to tackle um, for as for a reason that people wouldn't be able to come to the museum itself uh, kids who were in hospitals uh, so so we worked out a series of programs where we would adjust the programming that we did uh, to our particular audience. And one of the ways we adjusted it was through virtual programming, um, not in a virtual conference room. What I really wanted to do was to put the folks who are watching stuff virtually in the museum. Doing a, a, a video conference from a video conference in a, in a, from video conference room in a museum, I don't feel like that was for us an authentic museum experience. So we wanted to kind of take it out of that uh, video conference room and put the video conference on the museum floor. So uh, that's a little bit of my background. Uh, I've 
love what I do. I love being at the Cradle of Aviation. It has one of three lunar modules in the world. Uh, so it's kind of exciting to be there. So I'm going to go to presentation mode here. And here we are. So teaching in and with uh, virtual museums. So that's my museum, Cradle of Aviation Museum. It is in Garden City, New York. And it is on the former site of the Mitchell Field. Uh, Mitchell Field was an Air Force base uh, in the 20th century, right smack dab in the middle of Long Island. Uh, the reason it was there was because Long Island uh, was home to the largest natural prairie east of the Allegheny Mountains. So in early aviation, it was a perfect place for airplanes, unreliable airplanes, to take off and land uh, without causing too much damage if they missed their approach. Uh, not too many houses around, not too many trees. So it was a perfect place for early aviation. That's why we are called the cradle of aviation. Uh, you know, the birthplace of aviation, depending on who you talk to, uh, was North Carolina. Some folks will say Ohio because they were from there. But we don't claim to be the birthplace of aviation. We are the cradle of aviation, where aviation grew up, where aviation became mainstream. Uh, at the Cradle of Aviation, we are also home to the JetBlue Sky Theater Planetarium, which is the third largest dome in the United States. It has 300 seats inside of it. So I'm just tickled uh, to be able to go to work at a, at a place like this. I love it. I love, I love everything about it. Prior to uh, COVID-19, we hosted approximately 75,000 youth every year through all these programs uh, that you see here. Uh, we, did, we didn't have too big of a virtual outreach program. That was something that we were just starting to uh, get our feet wet with. Uh, so we were seeing all these kids doing all these programs from school field trips to outreach trips where we'd go out to various schools on Long Island and in New York City. Uh, we would have STEM partnerships. We would work with students on job shadowing programs uh, with all of our STEM partners. Uh, so uh, so uh, careers in, in various STEM fields. So we would actually bring kids from schools, high schools, all Long Island to these locations, and they would be able to follow professionals in the field and learn about uh, different STEM careers. So we had, we had a bunch of stuff going on, and then in March, like every place else, uh, it all stopped, uh, and and we we struggled uh, to to a stay open, which is an obvious concern, uh, but b uh, stay stay relevant, uh, and and stay I don't I'm, necessary isn't the right word, but how could we provide the enrichment that we provided as a museum without people coming to the museum, which was the vast majority of our, of our programs, the vast majority of students that we reached. So we had to, we had to scramble a bit. Uh, before we left, uh, myself and our social media manager, we probably did about 70 or 80 uh, short videos that ended up on TikTok. Uh, just, we were just giving that a try and, and that worked pretty well just to keep our name out there, but we wanted to get a little bit more um, of a deeper engagement virtually, which is important because as you know, as educators, uh, the virtual museum, virtual learning is, is going to be our new, our new normal for the uh, foreseeable future. So, uh, you know, you gotta, you gotta sink or swim. So, we, at the Cradle of Aviation, uh, we opened up our virtual museum, and it is right at our website, which I'm going to click right there, and it should open up. That brings you to our page, and if you just scroll through, launch your voyage, and that brings you to this page. So you have our virtual museum, our educational resources, uh, various things that you can go through, at-home activities uh, on YouTube, longer activities, uh, learn with educator Tom. That and some devil there. Uh, and then uh, if, if students or adults have questions about our collection, if they have questions about, um, about anything actually uh, to do with aviation history, uh, they, could, they could write to us and we can give them a hand. We have a video collection from our curator 
uh, virtual scavenger hunt and virtual backgrounds for your Zoom meeting because who doesn't want the lunar module as your background in your Zoom meetings or the A10 Thunderbolt 2. All good times. Uh, but what I want to focus on is this one right here, take a virtual tour. What we did was uh, we took 360-degree cameras and put them in our galleries. So that way, virtually, you could go through our entire gallery. Now, we had some programs set up with, uh, with uh, some high schools, uh, some local high schools in the area, uh, where we did virtual tours, guided virtual tours. Now, teachers can use these virtual tours for free. Uh, you don't have to go through us. You can just go to the website and go to the virtual tour. So here we have uh, the Dream of Wings gallery. That's a uh, pre, pre uh, heavier than aircraft flight. And I'm going to go to the 360 Street View, but also we have all these pages here that give more background information on uh, some of the artifacts that you'll find in there. So here's the Lilienthal glider. And there's Otto up there in his glider. That's how it looks in the museum. And it's just a little background on the various artifacts uh, that you'll find in that specific gallery. All right, and we have that for all the items that are in there. So I'm gonna go back and actually go to the Google Street View. And it's just like the Street View that you have uh, when you're in Google Maps. You can go through the galleries, you can look up. There's the tetral, tetrahedral kite. Uh, invented by Alexander Graham Bell. He's known for his telephone, but hey, he also was into kites, who knew? Uh, so you can go through the entire museum. There's Otto again up there. Uh, Otto Lilienthal liked to jump off of mountains. Uh, so you can guess how he died. He died at 103 years old in his bed, surrounded by his loved ones. No, no, he died jumping off a mountain. And his final words were, sacrifices must be made. Those were actually his final words. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't anything like, um, what could possibly go wrong? Watch this. <laughs> hey, check this out. <laughs> that doesn't look too far. Uh, so, so you can go through pre-flight into Hempstead Plains, Long Island. Uh, during the oldest, uh, the earliest days of aviation. And right there on the screen is uh, a replica of the first airplane to fly over Long Island, the Golden Flyer built by a gentleman named Glenn Curtis. And uh, one of the jewels of our collection right here is a Blario airplane. This is the fourth oldest plane in the United States. It is the first airplane that, has, that was uh, imported into the United States. So, this is what I was talking about before uh, with, with making a virtual experience immersive. Uh, something like this, we can go through our museum and no, it's not the same as being there, uh, but you can see what you would see uh, going through World War I, going into the Golden Age Gallery. Uh, there's the, the Spirit of St. Louis. Now, the actual Spirit of St. Louis is obviously down in Washington, D.C. Uh, this actually is its sister plane, uh, built by the same company around the same time. This is actually in the movie Spirit of St. Louis with Jimmy Stewart. So uh, if you see that movie, that's the plane that was in it. So and and you see, could, if if somebody wanted to do this, they could contact you and you could like be their docent going through the museum, correct? Absolutely, yes, we could. We can provide guided tours. Now what we're going to do now that Nassau County has entered phase two of our reopening is that we're actually gonna be able to do these tours live from the floor uh, with, with iPads and actually uh, bring the iPads around and point them at things. We can zoom in on things uh, and, and make it a much more organic experience, but uh, in the meantime, until we get to that point, this is so much better than nothing. And it's, in my opinion, so much better than standing there with a model of an airplane. Um, just my opinion. But what we did with this, and, and we're not the only museums that have this. In fact, if I go back to my page here, uh, there are other museums that are doing this. But when we did it, 
we worked with a group of high schoolers uh, from uh, Westbury, and these students, this was post, post COVID, post school closings, uh, these students, their, their job was to create uh, a presentation uh, with another student, uh, if, if that was possible, if they had the means to work with another student, and then present their, their uh, research back to us, back to their teacher, and to the other students. So we did a tour of the galleries, and then they had to choose an artifact. They had to choose um, uh, whether it be an airplane, whether it be a display case, but they had to choose one of them and then research that object or that person and create a presentation to bring back to us. Or they could do a research project on something that was from the same time. And these are just, uh, just three examples of some of the projects uh, that they did. Uh, down there is Eleanor Smith, the Space Race, and the Golden Age Gallery, uh, the Martin B10. So these are all projects that they did that were inspired by our galleries. Now, I just want to go back for a second because that Eleanor Smith one, and let me get back to the virtual museum here, go down to our gallery here. The one on Eleanor Smith that that student did was inspired by this flight suit right here. That flight suit belonged to Eleanor Smith. Now, Eleanor Smith got her pilot's license when she was 16 years old. And she was hanging out at what is now called Roosevelt Field. It's a mall now. At the time, it was called Curtis Field. Uh, and it was an airstrip. It was, it was, you know, it had runways on, it had hangars. Um, but a barnstormer came into town. And he had just crashed his airplane into Hellgate Bridge. Uh, he was trying to fly under it. And while he was there, he had said that 16-year-old Eleanor Smith had chickened out from doing a similar stunt. Now, Eleanor Smith, being your typical teenager, was not, not prone to rise to that kind of, kind of bait. You know, she, she was very level-headed, you know, hardly any you know, irrational thoughts or anything. Just like um, me, right? Just like you, Mitch, yeah. Uh, but what she did was she scoped out the river where the bridges were, you know, checked out the tides. And then at age 17, she took her plane, took off from Curtis Field, Roosevelt Field, and flew under all four bridges that connect Manhattan to Long Island. She's the only person to ever do that. And she did it at age 17. Her pilot's license was suspended for 10 days, but in the envelope along with that notice of suspension was a note asking for her autograph. So, Eleanor Smith did that. We have her flight suit here. And that inspired a pair of students to research Eleanor Smith. And in the time that they were doing their research, they found this quote from her. Um, and, and it struck us all during the presentation uh, that, that some of the stereotypes that you're hearing about, uh, you know, they're still, they're still around today. And women like Eleanor Smith, almost 100 years ago, were out there uh, trying to uh, prove those stereotypes uh, were just that, were just stereotypes, that anybody could do anything if given the opportunity. So that's one way that we, um, that we used our museum to, to create uh, an immersive environment where students could then be inspired to do their own work. Uh, so in this case, it was a research project that they then had to present. Uh, so so that's, that's what we did. I'm sure other people, I'm sure you, could come up with other ideas uh, for, for that type of, uh, of a situation. Uh, we go all the way through, uh, through space flight, through the lunar module, uh, through uh, space shuttles actually, and the International Space Station. So the whole history of aviation and space flight 
is in that museum and it's available uh, for you for free to use. And we're not the only ones that do that. Uh, Google Arts and Culture, uh, click on that. They have all these museums that are available. And I know you probably already know this stuff, but they have all these museums available that you can explore. And I'm going to go to, just because I know it so well, I'm gonna to go to the Intrepid Museum, my old stomping grounds. And I'm hoping to not pass it by, there it is. So I'm gonna click on the Intrepid Museum, there it is. It's a World War II aircraft carrier. Uh, it served from 1943 to 1974. Uh, it served three tours in Vietnam. Uh, and it's just an incredible, incredible place and you have all of these 360 views. So you can go to Pier 86. You can go right to the top of the aircraft carrier Intrepid. And not only can you see the planes, including there's the A-12 predecessor to the SR-71 Blackbird. You can also see the beautiful New York City skyline. Uh, there's an A-6 Intruder, uh, F-11 Tiger. Uh, and in the back there is the Space Shuttle Pavilion home to Enterprise, uh, the prototype Space Shuttle Orbiter. So you can immerse yourself and your students in these spaces. Uh, it's, it's really a fantastic tool and one that can be used not only during this time, during COVID-19, but you can then use it uh, for other groups that can't come to the museum. Uh, we've used this for students, um, we've used this type of virtual learning for students in hospitals, uh, for students uh, who, are, who are serving uh, sentences, juvenile offenders. Um, we've used these, uh, these types of programs for students around the world who just can't get to the museum because they're in Saskatchewan. Um, virtual learning is very big in Saskatchewan, by the way, I'm not sure why, but I've had a lot of, a lot of groups from Saskatchewan. So uh, it's, just, it's just a fantastic tool. Google Arts and Culture is, uh, is a great resource to use. Uh, and you don't just have to do virtual tours. You can go to specific pieces of art in art museums, and you can analyze them uh, together. Uh, you, can, you can augment them. If only there was some sort, of, some sort of software, maybe an app that you could download onto, onto a device and use it. Uh, to, to create some sort of reality that maybe is augmented in some way, shape, or form. Uh, Mitch, I don't know if you, if you could get on that or... or I, no, I can't think of one. Can you? No, no. Oh. Not off the top of my head. There was an interesting question about when you set up the, the virtual tour, tour and you took 360 photos. Yeah. How did you then post those, those 360 photos? How did you get them into Google Street View? And how did you get them as a web tour? That is an excellent question that I will send to uh, Rod, who actually actually did it. You do need a 360 camera, but you can upload it to uh, Google Street View on your own. Um, I can, if you, I have my email at the end, I can connect you to Rod, who is our technical guy, who can absolutely tell you the process for getting that up there. I thought, um, that, I thought that was a great question too. Yeah, I actually have done it using 360 photos and I use the Instructure, which attaches to an iPad. Mm -hmm. And then um, and then I string those photos together using a package called Wanda VR. You know, I put the uh, name of it in the in the chat. Mm -hmm. So that's that that also is another way of doing it. But I love the street view way that you guys have done it. Yeah, it's it's a real the, the one thing that's a little tricky with it is sometimes if you hit the arrow in the wrong spot, it brings you through a wall and you're in a completely different gallery. Uh, it doesn't respect walls, essentially, is, is what I'm saying. Uh, but it, it, is, it, it was truly a game changer because we were able to honor commitments uh, for grants because of it. Uh, we, were able, we were able to work with students um, that we would not have otherwise been able to work with. Uh, and actually, that brings up a, a point uh, that is, is still an issue uh, with all of this because we can create all this wonderful stuff, but uh, attendance is an issue. Uh, students uh, who maybe are 
are uh, income generators right now. Uh, that, that's something that might keep people out of the virtual classrooms. I know that in New York City, they had less than a third of students log in uh, for, for classes at a time uh, in many cases. So New York City, to, to counter some of that, uh, they had a program where you could request uh, a device and, and, uh, and different carriers had free hotspots around the city. So that's, that's one, way, one way to, uh, to overcome that. Uh, but it is, it is an issue that, that we face. But I really do think that as virtual learning becomes more and more the norm, and as, as this becomes our every day, for the, for at least for the near future, um, that those attendance numbers will, will hopefully go up. Uh, on the plus side though, I think that out of necessity, a lot of, a lot of fear and a lot of trepidation uh, to virtual learning has been removed uh, due to necessity. Uh, so, I mean, it, it, I don't wanna say that that's a good thing to come from this, this horrible situation. But um, it's something that moving forward, we can go forward armed with that, with that new uh, knowledge and that new comfort level to work virtually. Um, does anybody have any other questions so far or any comments, concerns, witticisms, anecdotes? Sorry, I was muted. I will say <laughs> people have been saying that it's, it's pretty incredible what you've done. Oh, okay. that's good to hear. I'm glad I, on the other hand, am not impressed at all. I know. Actually, right. I, I'm with you, Mitch. Uh, I'm just, you know, it's whatever. You, know? You, guys, you guys have done a great job. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's, 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 so, it's so incredible to be in front of these machines. So the hope is, uh, at, least, at least on my end, the hope is that we spark an interest, just like we were doing with that program. We spark the interest and then they went off and, and did their teacher guided uh, research to do their presentations. Uh, it's my hope that now those kids that did that program about Eleanor Smith, now they wanna come back and see her flight suit in person. You know, uh, that they, they want to uh, see everything up close. Uh, she I was, was hoping that, that a couple of them would just rent planes and fly under the bridges. Oh yeah, well, right. uh, that, they have a few more probably, uh, you know, restrictions in place since since 1928, I would imagine. Uh, it's funny because just before she took off, Charles Lindbergh tapped her on her shoulder in a plane and said, good luck, keep your nose down in the turns. So that, that'd be a good confidence piece for her. <laughs> uh, so, so that's virtual learning from the museum floor. The planetarium is a whole other thing. Uh, the virtual planetarium is, is what we've been doing. And it's really been, uh, it's been probably our most, our most successful uh, program that we've done virtually, at least the one we've done most consistently uh, virtually. And the reason why is because, uh, at least one reason I think, uh, is because when you go to the museum, you see the planetarium show, it's something that, that is, otherworldly, if you'll pardon the pun, but it's also something that is not accessible to you at home. You come to the planetarium to experience something that you can't experience in your house. Doing the planetarium virtually, the best responses that I've had was, wow, this is something that I can take now and use on my own. Because the software that we use to do the virtual planetarium is open source freeware. So when we do a program, really what people are, are coming for is, is our knowledge about the night sky, about, about the universe, um, and, and our, our alacrity with the program itself, but also maybe to learn how to get that program so that they can you know, uh, start on their own path to understanding uh, how, how to use it in their own lives without us. So it's that, you know, it's kind of thing like, yeah, we're, we're giving fish, but we're also teaching the fish as well uh, with this. And the program that we use is called Stellarium. And Stellarium 
is available at stellarium.org, stellarium.org. It is, like I said, it's open source, it is free, uh, and you can download it right onto your computer, uh, Mac, PC, uh, it works on all of them, and it is fantastic. And we've done live streams with this. Uh, we've done uh, private programs via Zoom, similar to this, uh, and, and they have been very, very well received. And if you don't mind, I would like to share uh, that with you. So I'm going to actually, <laughs> I'm going to stop sharing for a second because I have to open up my program and reshare. Share screen. And while you're doing that, it looks like David Lockett has also used Telerium. Oh, really? Uh, David, have you used it uh, in uh, programming or have you used it uh, personally? And I'm looking for my chat here. There it is. Oh, thank you for putting that there. Oh, good. Yes. So, yeah, you know, you know about the features. Then uh, it is a surprisingly. Oh, great. Excellent. So you have used it um, with the, with the public. Um, it is a surprisingly powerful and easy to use program. Uh, the balance that it strikes is is pretty fantastic. Uh, so along the bottom here you have uh, what we'll say is, is the, the basic stuff, the stuff that you use uh, to just basically do sky viewing. And then if you wanna get deeper, you can go into this side menu here. Uh, you can go to any location uh, on the planet. You can go to any location on another planet in the solar system or a moon in the solar system. Uh, it's really a, a fantastic feature. So I'm in New York City, so obviously that's where I'm going to be. But it's so easy to change your locations that you can, in a program, a virtual planetarium program, you can show people the difference between the this, this night sky at 40 degrees north latitude versus 20 degrees north latitude. You can see the constellation shift, and, and you are immersed in that, and, and you get it. That's, that's probably the best best way I can I can put in probably the best compliment I can give Stellarium uh, is that it helps folks get it um, but you can change your date your time any date past present future uh, you can uh, change your star lore uh, for example uh, we are using the western constellations so up here in the north a lot of them come from the Greek tradition but you can go into all different uh, cultures and all different night skies. So there is so much that you can do uh, and, with this. And I love when, when you were science. showing it to me, you kind of blocked out the sun. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we're gonna do that actually next uh, because I believe it's a uh, fifth grade uh, next generation science standards. Um, it talks about brightness of a star compared to the sun. Uh, the sun is so much brighter than the other stars because it is so much closer. So we talk about the distance uh, to the sun versus other stars. So I'm going to take out the atmosphere and it brings up the night sky. Now you can bring up constellation lines, constellation names, constellation artwork. Uh, you can bring all that up and you just click and drag to maneuver around. Uh, if you want to fast forward, just hit the fast forward button. It's as easy as pie uh, to get started. But again, you can really get deep into some things. So here we have the sun. Now I'm gonna take out the artwork just so we can see things better. I'm gonna click on the sun, left click, and when you click on it, all this wonderful information comes up over here. Uh, but we're gonna focus on magnitude. The magnitude of the sun, and I should say the apparent magnitude of the sun, is minus 26.71, by far the brightest object in our sky. When it comes to magnitude, the lower the number, the brighter the object, um, which might sound, sound kind of counterintuitive if you're, if you're just you know, hearing that for the first time, but I like to think of it as you, know, you think something is of the first magnitude, well, that's better than something of the second magnitude or third magnitude. So it kind of makes sense, uh, but then 
we got to to the point where we started counting things that were brighter uh, than than things that were you know the first magnitude. So we kept on getting brighter and brighter and brighter. Um, the dimmest star that the human eye can see is is about uh, six on the magnitude scale. So a first magnitude star is a hundred times brighter than that sixth magnitude star. Okay, uh, not that that's important for your life, but just how it works. So we have the sun here and its magnitude is minus 26.71, but its absolute magnitude is 4.83. And the absolute magnitude of a star is calculated at 10 parsecs away, so about 32.6 light years away, how bright the star is from that distance. So by looking at the absolute magnitude, we can tell the true brightness of a star. So you click on the sun, you see it's between four and five in magnitude. Now let's click on this star right here, Rigel, which is in the constellation of Orion. Now its magnitude is a positive 0.15. That's a bright star. Nowhere near as bright as the sun in our sky. But its absolute magnitude is minus 6.96. So which one's brighter? The sun or Rigel? Obviously, Rigel is the brighter. The sun's absolute magnitude is 4.8 something. All right, 4.83. Rigel minus 6.96. And yet in our sky, the sun is much brighter. And then you also have the distances here. So you can go through that as well. The Rigel is 862.85 light years away from the Earth. So even though it's a much brighter star, it's much, much farther away. So you have all of that right here in Stellarium. Uh, it's, like I said, it's robust. You don't necessarily need uh, the right ascension and declaration and, and declination. You don't necessarily need to know, uh, you know how long it takes to go across the sky, but it's there. Just this morning, I used this, uh, this program to do uh, a planet tour for a group of preschoolers. And, and so we zoomed in on every planet in the solar system uh, from Mercury all the way out through Neptune. And I'm sorry, but Pluto is not a planet. Uh, so I don't call it one. Uh, I'm with Neil deGrasse Tyson. Uh, you can zoom in on the moon. You can zoom in on all these things right here. Again. It's an immersive environment that the kids, the adults can download and use on their own. You can show the phases of the moon. At least I think you can. There we go. It's coming. Now, on the dome version of this, you don't get that, that big wobble, but you get it on the desktop version. I'm still working on trying to smooth that out. But you can go through the phases of the moon. You can talk about the varying brightness of the moon. It's really a, a very, very powerful tool. Uh, and I highly recommend using it uh, personally, but also in your classroom. Uh, it's, it's really a fantastic, fantastic thing. All right, so I'm going to go back now to my presentation. Does anybody have any questions or does anybody want to see anything uh, with Stellarium? We're going to talk a little bit more about it later on, but I just wanted to check in. And let me check. I, th I thought it was so cool. I thought it was oh. cool when you showed it to me before. I still think it's so cool. Oh, well, thank you very much, Mitch. I appreciate that. And thank you, David. I appreciate you being here with us. All right, so I'm going to stop sharing that and go back to our other Thing here, teaching with virtual museum. Um, okay, so here we are. So uh, last year we 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 purchased uh, 3D Bear at the Cradle of Aviation Museum, and we went off of the Mars Habitat program uh, to do our first program. And what's really great is that with uh, 3D Bear at a museum, you have uh, a really great environment to add things to. So when we were doing our Mars environment, we thought, you know what? We have one of three lunar modules in existence 
So maybe we should also do the lunar environment and talk about that. And what are the differences uh, between setting up an environment on Mars versus setting up on an for an environment on the moon? Uh, for example, on Mars, you could use a wind turbine. On the moon, a wind turbine will do you absolutely no good because there is no atmosphere on the moon. So like things like that that the kids had to consider as they created their own environment. And then they would present what they built in whatever space they were building to the class. And they could put in anything that they wanted to so long as they could justify it. So they could put a cow up there if they could justify bringing the cow there, how the cow's gonna survive there, does the cow have a habitat? Is this a special kind of Mars cow or a lunar cow? Is this the cow that jumped over the moon? Things like that. They just had to justify it for the group. Uh, and they did, they did great jobs. This kid uh, discovered that you could write on the screen, so, so they were very excited about that. Uh, this habitat has no worries when it comes to oxygen. Plenty, plenty of oxygen on that, on that. But again, we're closed. So what we are, are trying to do, and we're going to be doing it with one of our STEM camps this summer, uh, with 3D Bear, uh, we have a bunch of iPads at the museum, but you don't necessarily need to use your equipment. You can use student equipment so long as they have the login information. So we give them the login information for the class and then they could get on to their own device. Uh, and, and so we don't have to worry about kids sharing devices, number one, which is fantastic, but you can do it completely virtually. Do a class in Zoom, have them work on their own uh, whether it's a science program or whether it's, you know, a narrative program creating a story or a setting. Uh, so here's one that I made up just using a picture, a random Apollo picture. So I added, you know, this little oxygen tank here. I made the mistake of putting a wind turbine on the moon. I'm, oh boy, I'm just the worst. And then uh, a medieval house uh, that, I, that I stuffed there on the moon. This program works with a 2D picture in front of you, which is such a great thing because it, it allows us to really um, be limitless with the settings that the kids are going to be able to put their habitats or put their settings for their narratives. Uh, so they can find any picture that they want and add their own elements into it. Uh, I find uh, with uh, with 3D Bear, I actually find that Sketchfab is such a fantastic uh, tool to use. I love that the textures are on there. Uh, it it really is uh, fantastic. Uh, yeah, it, and I'll and just maybe explain. Sketchfab is a collection of 3D objects on the web. And oh, yeah. um, you can go on the web and you can access Sketchfab. Some of them are free, some of them are paid for. But directly from 3D Bear, you can access all the free um, objects directly from Sketchfab. So you just right. type in something, you know, um, you know, uh, oxygen tank or windmill or whatever, and then you can place that object into whatever story you're creating or whatever scene you're creating. Right, and it's it's the it's it's endless almost. You put in I you notice I put in R2D2 that was from Sketchfab. Uh, you can put in people, you can put in objects. Uh, sometimes if, if, and I'm not sure what it is, sometimes if it's too complex or if it's more of a scene, uh, you can run into problems, but for the models, it works really, really well. Yeah, you uh, can put in Voldemort. Oh, awesome. And Voldemort would fit right here with our Grum and Goose. We can have Voldemort getting onto the airplane. Uh, and this is another way that we're gonna be using it. Just taking scenes from our virtual tours and having them as settings for these 3D Bear programs. So here's our lunar module, uh, and you can use that as your habitat, as your setting for whatever you are creating. Uh, and then uh, with, with the virtual planetarium, I was thinking, hey, you know, we have the artwork there. You know, there are tons of animals, so the kids can build their own sky 
their own 3D sky using some of these models. So there's the Great Bear and Leo the Lion using 3D models that we imported, put onto a 2D screen, put onto the computer screen. You can probably see my reflection at the bottom with my camera trying to get it. Uh, you know, they can make up their own constellations and manipulate the models to fit in them. So they can, they can create their own sky culture and create their own stories, their own mythologies to go along with it. Uh, I mean, it's just, the possibilities are just endless and, and, and a lot of fun. It looks like the Great Bear has a hairball there that it's spitting up uh, that star. But, uh, and then, of course, other museums. This is from the Vatican. Uh, this is one of Raphael's masterpieces, the School of Athens. And, and just me personally, I felt like it was missing something in the middle. So I stuck R2D2 in there. So, but you can, you can annotate, you can, you can call out certain things, you can add things that you, it's, and the resources to do these types of things are, are huge because there are so many, min, so many museums on that Google Arts and Culture uh, platform. And there are so many museums that offer these virtual tours that provide endless canvases for you to use. Uh, what's amazing about a program like 3D Bear with the augmented reality is that you can put it into, three, into that 3D space and kids can do that at their home. But it's kind of nice to know that it works with the 2D space as well. Um, so that's what we're doing. Uh, and I sincerely, I sincerely hope that, that you got some ideas. I sincerely hope that you, um, that you, um, are interested in, in, in checking us out. But if you have any questions, uh, that's my contact information right there. Please feel free to email me. I check it often. Uh, but I was just wondering uh, in the time that we have left, because I think we have a, a few minutes left, uh, if you have any experiences uh, with virtual learning or, or challenges uh, with virtual learning that you feel like um, a partner institution like Cradle of Aviation or any partner institution might be able to help you with, uh, something that you don't necessarily have uh, an answer for or a suggestion for, um, or a suggestion for me, uh, I would love to hear it because like everybody else, we're, we're trying to find our way. Right. So yeah, if, if any of you uh, have a question or a comment, how you might use it, I know at one point, uh, Teresa was mentioning that uh, she assists another museum and that maybe they could contact you and you Absolutely. can help them. Absolutely. I would, nothing would give me more pleasure. Uh, this, is, this is one of those situations where, I mean, we are all truly in the same boat. Um, and so uh, anything that I can do uh, to help people not make the same mistakes I made, uh, the same mistakes that our museums have made, uh, you know, I am happy to share. You're very and, welcome. And do you have, if you do a tour, can you, well, I, I know that you have uh, some of the instructors are Spanish speaking, so you could yeah. probably do the tour in Spanish. Are yep. there other languages that you can do a tour in? Right now, just Spanish. Uh, we are, I have a couple of grants in, uh, the world of grant asking and grant making, uh, like everything else is turned upside down. Right. Uh, so so I, I had a grant in uh, for just, just that, uh, working to create uh, tours that would be in different languages, uh, at the very least uh, translating, uh, translated into different languages on a sheet to start. And then uh, there's a uh, Google technology that allows you to translate in real time into the ear, mm -hmm. uh, which is which is just, I mean, it's it's a babble fish is right. what it is. And it, it's an amazing time. Uh, so, but right now we, we do offer tours in English and Spanish uh, virtually, yeah. That's, that's pretty amazing. Um, I don't know, maybe just show a couple of the other gal, you know, uh, you know. Oh, sure, absolutely. Uh, so I'm so, going to. Because those okay. are so cool. Thanks, uh, let's see here. So I can bring you right through actually to, oh, and my chat's coming down there, there we go. So here we are with Eleanor Smith, 
So truly, we're, we're a regional museum, the Crayola of Aviation. We document the history of aviation on Long Island. Uh, but, and I think this is an opportunity for a lot of regional museums um, to expand their audiences uh, because the history of aviation on Long Island is the history of aviation. Uh, it started, yes, with the Wright brothers down down in you know in uh, in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, Kill Devil Hill, uh, or depending on who you talk to, you know, it started in Europe, you know, uh, over there. But um, but so many advances were being made in so many places at the same time. So the advances that were being made here were being made in other places. So we have we have you know one of the 10 oldest airplanes in the world. So that's, that's, that goes beyond Long Island. Uh, here in our World War II gallery, uh, we have the Grumman uh, F6F Hellcat right there. Uh, we have the Grumman Wildcat right there, the TBM Avenger. These are airplanes that turned the tide of the war in the Pacific. Uh, the Wildcat uh, was underpowered when you compared it to the Japanese Zero airplanes but the pilots were so well trained that they still held their own. And then uh, the Grumman Hellcat came along and it completely took the Japanese pilots by surprise because it kind of looks like the Wildcat, but it's able to do things that the Wildcat couldn't dream. Uh, going over here, we have the Republic P-47 Thunderbolt, uh, the Tuskegee Airmen. Uh, they're famous for flying the P-51 Mustangs. Uh, but the plane that they painted the tails red on first was the P-47 uh, built by Republic. Uh, that's the Thunderbolt right there. Up there is a Waco glider. So the Waco gliders, they were towed behind uh, huge transport aircraft and then dropped behind the German lines in France during D-Day. So we have that sitting up there. Uh, you could put a Jeep inside of there and it could roll out the front. Uh, I mean, it's just incredible the reach of of these of these airplanes. Uh, so going through, we have World War II on the home front. Uh, we can go through uh, the jet age over here. At least I think we can. There we go. So we have the the Cougar right there. That's a Grumman airplane. Uh, Leroy Grumman really liked cats, I guess, because Grumman airplanes they were named. Uh, the Hellcat, the Wildcat, the Tomcat, the Cougar, the Bearcat. Uh, Grumman built one uh, aircraft uh, that was meant for the civilian market. That's it right there. They thought people coming home from World War II would want to fly planes. Uh, that market never materialized. But this plane here is called the Kitten. And it's a Grumman airplane. So never materialized though that market. This is my dream retirement job right here to fly this airplane. It is a Republic CB. It is an amphibious airplane. It's a push plane and inside it's like a big car interior. I would love to make my living in my, in my golden years just flying that back and forth from New York out to the east end of Long Island. Just got to get enough money to do that. Uh, but and then uh, Republic, that other aircraft company I was telling you about, they like Thunder. So we have the Thunderbolt over there. This is the Thunder Jet. This is the Thunderbolt 2. They had the Thunder Chief. Republic liked Thunder for some reason. So you can go through these galleries uh, either by clicking those arrows over and over and over again, go through commercial aviation, uh, or you can go back to that main page and you can uh, select your gallery. But if we come into uh, the space age here, uh, if you look up over here, let me see if I can get to that spot. There it is. Recognize that? Oh, that's the oh, first. Uh, that's the first uh, tau star, right? Uh, it's the first satellite. Satellite. Sputnik. And yeah, now obviously it's not the real Sputnik one that burned up in the atmosphere, but this was actually a gift from the Soviet Union to Nassau County. So that is as close as anyone in the United States has to the real thing. Uh, and it was actually a gift from the Soviet Union because they had some sort of 
a state in Nassau County. It's kind of actually a, a bit of a strange story. There's a little little weirdness going on with that estate. But hey, back in the 1980s, they said, here, have Sputnik's sister. And so we do right there. Uh, at Cradle of Aviation, we have, uh, I like to say, not one, but actually two lunar modules because we also have this one right here, which is the prototype lunar module. So when they would test anything out, when they would try to see if something would fit, this is where they did it. So this was actually at the Grumman Corporation uh, in a clean room, and it is a prototype lunar module. And then around the corner, we have the real thing, one of three in the world. And then if you go out, back out to the galleries. This is actually my favorite. So every astronaut that went to the moon, oops, wrong way, sorry about that. Every astronaut that went to the moon, they had to train. And if I could get there, that would be fantastic. Where are you? I can't get there, Goddard rocket. Anyway, I don't wanna, I don't wanna waste too much time with this, but uh, we have the actual trainer, uh, lunar module trainer that Neil Armstrong, uh, Buzz Aldrin, Michael, uh, not Michael Collins, he was command module pilot. Uh, every Apollo astronaut that went to the moon trained in this trainer that we have at the museum. So, I mean, yeah, we're, we're a regional museum, but, but our, our reach is, is all the way to the moon. And as, as, and, and Mars, and, and Mars too. And Mars, exactly. So we're trying to really virtually uh, expand our reach. So take these techniques that we're doing uh, in an effort to uh, widen, widen our audience and, and bring more attention to this, to this amazing stuff. Um, this is, that, has to be inspiring for kids and get a lot of kids going through the museum or, um, or doing the projects you have them do. Mm -hmm. uh, have to be attracted to STEM careers after after doing this, right? Oh, absolutely. And what's what's fantastic is is we have partnerships uh, with different high schools and different districts throughout the island, and we we have partnerships with various uh, companies, STEM related companies throughout Long Island. Uh, a lot of aerospace, a lot of cybersecurity, um, and we we match up groups with companies and and kids can do job shadowing. Uh, so what's what's nice is is that you know they find about out about different careers uh, and then they also have their connections. So when the time comes for an internship, it's not a cold call, it's not a cold email. They have that connection where they say, hello, I was job shadowing uh, you know last semester. Uh, I'm very interested in this field and I was wondering if I could come in to interview for an internship at your company. So it, it does open the door uh, for students to find out about the STEM careers that are in their own backyard and there there are plenty of them. That's great. So do you have any like closing thoughts that you want to give to people? Um, my closing thought is when I was at Intrepid and I was managing community engagement, uh, we had two objectives before anything else. Uh, before any uh, academic objective. Our two objectives were a positive social experience, that was one, followed by a positive educational experience. And those were our first two objectives. And we would follow up with teachers uh, to, to make sure that, that we were meeting uh, those objectives. So we asked the teachers, you know, um, what, what behaviors did you see that showed that the students were enjoying yourself? Uh, what behaviors did you see that showed that the students were or were not engaged with the content? Uh, and then we had our other academic object objectives after those. Mm -hmm. And I think in this time, kids, teachers, guardians are all under so much stress that those two objectives are now even more important uh, than, than they were pre-COVID-19. Uh, if you have a program, or if I have a program, I don't want to speak for you, uh, where we didn't get through a 
third of what I wanted to get through academically, but the kids were engaged the whole time uh, and the kids were enjoying it and had a positive experience. I call that a successful program. And I wrote that into our guidelines as community engagement. I mean, there, there are school and teacher programs. Uh, there, there are other programs that are more tied to, to, uh, to standards. But when, when we're working with students who may not have had a positive educational experience, uh, working with adults who may not have had a positive educational experience and for whom positive social experiences uh, are, are uh, maybe, maybe uh, you know, rare commodities, uh, providing that first, I think, is, is, uh, is, a good, is a good way to approach it. Yeah, and it's the only thing that's, that basically is working when yeah. kids are, are remote. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I can see kids getting really excited you know, with these virtual tour, tours, with the with the guided tours, with the activities that you have for them, it's I, it's, it, it's amazing. Well, thank you, thank you very much. And again, if you have any questions, comments, concerns, witticisms, or anecdotes, uh, please feel free to send me an email. Uh, if you uh, have any suggestions, please also feel free to send me an email. Uh, I I am I am so willing to learn more. Uh, so please, if you have anything that you'd like to share with me, please do. Well, stay safe. Thank you. You do and, the same. And Tom, thank you so much. This was uh, it, it, this was phenomenal. Uh, okay. You've done a great job. Thank you, and thank you all for being here tonight. I know that we're we're coming up on nine o'clock, right. so that's that's like bedtime. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, Tom, I'll, I'll, I'm I'm sure we'll we'll talk in the next few weeks. Um, yeah. Thank thank you again for everybody. Uh, this is Mitch Weisberg for EdChat Interactive and good night. Hope to see some of you tomorrow night.